Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering Spark Summit 2017. Brought to you by Databricks. Welcome back to theCUBE, continuing our coverage here at Spark Summit 2017. What a great lineup of guests. I can't wait to introduce this gentleman. We have Intel's VP of the Software and Service Group, Mr. Michael Green. Michael, hey, welcome. Thank you for having me. All right, you want to have George with us over here, and George and I will both be peppering you with questions. Are you ready for that? I am, I got the salt to go with the pepper. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just got off the stage. You did a keynote this morning. What do you think was the most important message you delivered in your keynote? Well, it was interesting. One of the things that we're looking at with a big deal, so the big deal um, uh, framework, was we're, talk we we're hearing a lot of the challenges of making sure that these uh, AI type workloads scale easily. And one of the things when we open source Big DL, we really were designing it to leverage that spark ability for massive scale from the beginning. So mm -hmm. I thought that that was one of the things that connected with several of the keynotes ahead of me, was talking about if this is your challenge, here is mm -hmm. one of many solutions, but a very good one, that will let you take advantage of the scale that people have in their infrastructure, mm -hmm. lots of Xeons out there. Might as well make sure to fully utilize running the mm -hmm. workloads of the future, AI. Okay, so Cisco, or Intel, not just a hardware company, you do software, right? Well, you know, Intel's a <laughs> solutions company, yes. right? It, uh, and and uh, uh, hardware is awesome, but yeah. hardware without software is a brick. <laughs> right. Maybe a warm one, but it not doesn't do much. Brick. That's right, not a data brick, <laughs> just a brick. And, and not, uh, and not so melted many, down either. <laughs> that's right, that's right, you know, so sand without software is, doesn't go very far. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I see it as software is used to ignite the hardware so that you actually get useful productivity out of it. So as a software solution and as customers, right, there's, they have problems to solve. It's rare that they come in and say that, nope, I just need a nail, right? They're usually like, I need a home. Well, you can't just provide the nail, you have to provide all the pieces. And one of the things that's exciting for, for me being part of Intel is that we provide silicon, of course, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the processors, Xeon, accelerators, and now software tools, frameworks to make sure that a customer can actually really get the value of the entire solution. Okay, go ahead, George. Yeah. So, Michael, help us, um, those of us who've been watching sort of from afar but aren't up to date on the day-to-day, -day, you know, sort of tactics and strategy of what Intel's doing with uh, deep learning in terms of where does big DL fit and then the acquisition, you know, of the floating point gate array technology sure. so that there's, you know, uh, general purpose or special purpose acceleration on the chip. Right. You know, where, so how do those two work together along with the rest of the ecosystem? Sure, no, uh, great question. So if you think of Intel, really we're always looking at how we can leverage Moore's Law to get more and more integrated into the solution. Mm -hmm. um, and if you quickly step through kind of a brief history, or at one point we had a 386, which was a great integer mm -hmm. processor, which was partnered with a 387 for the uh, floating point accelerant. 486 combined that because we're able to leverage Moore's Law to bring those two together. Got a lot of reuse uh, for the instruction set with the acceleration. As we bring in, uh, Al uh, Altera was recently uh, uh, integrated into Intel. Uh, they come with a suite of incredible FPGAs and accelerators, um, as well as uh, another company with uh, Nirvana that's also has, has accelerators. And we're looking at those special case uh, opportunities to accelerate the user experience. So we're going to continue to follow that trend and make sure that you have the general purpose capabilities and where new workloads are coming in and we really see a lot of growth in the um, growth in AI. If we're going to, uh, as I think I said in the keynote, about 12X in growth by 2020, we need to make sure that we have the silicon as well as the software and that's where Big DL, to pull those two together to make sure that we're getting the full benefit of the solution. So, a couple years ago, we were told that um, Intel actually thought that there was going to be more Hadoop servers, and Hadoop is, you know, umbrella term for the ecosystem, than database servers in three to five years' time. Sure. When you look at um, deep learning, because we know it's so much more compute intensive than the traditional sort of statistical machine learning, if you look out three to five years, how much of the um, 
I don't know, compute cycles, share of workloads, do you see deep learning you know, comprising? Yeah, I, I think that um, uh, maybe in the last year, deep learning or AI as a, as a workload is about 7%. Um, but if you grow by 12x, it's, it's definitely growing quickly. Uh, so so as we're, what we're expecting is that AI will become inherent in pretty much every application. Um, an example of this is at one point face, facial detection was something that was like a, the new thing. You can't buy a camera that doesn't do that. Right? So if you pull up your camera and you see the little squares show up, it's like it's just commonplace. We're expecting that AI would just become an integral part of solutions, not a solution in and of itself. Right? It's, it's there to make software solutions smarter. It's there to make them go further. It's there to make them smarter. It's not there to be independent. It's like, wow, we got it. We came up with the We've identified the cat, that's cool, but if we're identifying problems or making sure that the, uh, you know, uh, the autonomous delivery systems don't kill a cat, <laughs> there's a little <laughs> bit more that needs to go on. So it's going to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. What about um, the trade-off between processing at the edge and, and learning in the cloud? Yeah. I mean, you can learn on the edge, you can learn in the cloud, you can, you can do the analysis on either end, the, the sort of the runtime. Sure. How do you guys see that being split up in the future? Absolutely, I, I think that the, the, the deep learning training, right, there's always opportunities to go through vast amount of data to figure out how to identify what's interesting, um, uh, identify new insights. Uh, once you have those models trained, then you want to use them everywhere. Um, and what makes sense, then, then we're switching from training to inference. Inference at the edge is, allows you to be more real time, uh, in some cases, you know, if you imagine you know, a smart camera, uh, even from a smart camera point of view, do I send all the data stream to uh, the data center? Well, maybe not. Let's, let's assume that it's uh, being used for, for uh, uh, highway patrol, right? Mm -hmm. If you identify the car speeding, then send the information, mm -hmm. right? Except it's leave me out, <laughs> kidding on that. <laughs> but, uh, um, um, but it's that kind of piece where you allow both sides to be smart more information for the continual training in the cloud, but also more ability to add compute to the edge so that we can do some really cool uh, activities right at the edge, real time, without uh, having to send all the information. And if you had to describe to people working on architectures for you know, the new distributed computing and IoT, um, what would an edge device look like in its you know, hardware footprint in terms of compute, memory, um, connectivity. Yeah. So, so in terms of connectivity, right, we're, we're expecting an explosion of 5G, right? A lot of high bandwidth, multiple things uh, uh, being connected with some type of communication 5G uh, capability, right? It won't just be about, you know, let's just say cars feeding back where they are uh, um, from their GPS, but it's going to be cars talking to other cars. Right, you know, maybe one needs to move over a lane. Can they adjust? Right, we're talking autonomous world. There's going to be so much interconnection through 5G. So I expect to see 5G show up in most edge devices. And to your point, I, I think it's very, very important to add that we expect edge devices to all have some kind of compute capability, not just sensors, but ability to sense and make some decisions based on what they're sensing. Right now, we're going to continue to see more and more compute. Uh, uh, go to the edge devices, and you know, as so again, when we look at leveraging the power of Moore's law, we're going to be able to move that compute that today is like, I mean, the, the, uh, the cloud is just incredible with this, you know, collective compute power. That will slowly move away, and and down we've seen that from mainframe to workstations to PCs, the phones, and to edge devices. I think that trend will continue, and we'll continue to see bigger data centers and, and other use cases that require deeper analysis. Uh, so, so from a developer's point of view, if you're working on an edge device, make sure it has great connectivity and compute. So one last follow up for me. Um, Google is making a, um, a special effort to build their own framework, open source at TensorFlow, and then marry it to specialized hardware, tensor processing units. Sure. So, Specialization versus generalization. Um, would uh, would you expect, or, or, or do you have a sense for someone who's running TPU in the cloud? Um, 
do you have a sense for if they're learning TensorFlow models or TensorFlow based models, mm -hmm. um, would there be uh, an advantage for that narrow set running on tensor processing units or would that be just as supported just as well on Intel hardware? You know, uh, uh, specialization is, you know, anything that's purpose built, uh, as he says, it's just not general purpose, but as I mentioned, over time, the specialized capabilities um, slide into general purpose uh, op opportunities. Uh, recently, right, we added uh, uh, ASNI, which is an encryption uh, uh, algorithm, into our processors, very specialized for encryption, decryption. But because it was so generally used now, it's now just part of our processor offering, it's just part of our instruction set. I expect to continue to see that trend. So many things may start off specialized, uh, uh, which is great, it's a great way to innovate. Uh, and then over time, if it becomes general purpose, or if it comes, you know, if it's so specialized that everyone's using it, it's now general purpose, <laughs> uh, and it slides into uh, the general purpose opportunity. I think that will be the, a continuation. We're seeing that. We've seen that since the dawn of the computer, specialized memory, specialized compute, specialized floating point uh, uh, capabilities are now just generally available. And so when we deploy things like uh, Big DL, a lot of the benefit of it is that we know the Xeon processor has so much capability because it has pulled in over time the best of the specialized use cases that are now generally used. Okay. Right, great okay. deep dive questions, George. Just wanted, we have a couple of minutes left, so sure. I know you brought a lot to this conference. They put you up on stage. So what Thank were you, you hoping to gain from the conference? Maybe come here to learn, or have you had any interesting conversations so far? Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm always excited about these conferences is that uh, open source community is just one that is so incredibly adaptive and innovative. So we're always out there looking to see where the world is going. Um, by doing that, we're learning where, because again, right, where the software goes, we want to make sure that the hardware that supports it, we're there uh, to meet their needs. Uh, so today, it was, we're, we're learning about new frameworks coming out, uh, you know, the, the next spark on the, on the roadmap, what they're looking at doing. Um, I expect that we'll hear a little bit more about scripting languages as well. All of that is just fantastic, because you know, I, I'm, I'm always impressed but have come to expect a lot of innovation, but still impressed by the amount of innovation. So uh, I, I, it's good to be in the right place. And uh, as we approach things from an Intel point of view, we know we approach it from a portfolio solution set. It's mm -hmm. not just silicon, it's not just uh, um, and, and accelerators, but it's from the hardware through the software solution. So mm -hmm. we know that we can uh, really help to accelerate the and usher in the next compute paradigm. So wow. this has been that fun. would be a great ending, but I got to ask you this. When you're <laughs> sitting in this chair next yes. year at Spark 2018, what do you hope to be talking about? Well, you know, one of the things I, uh, that we're looking and talking about is this massive amounts of data. I would love to be here next year talking more about the new memory technologies that are coming out that allow for tremendous more uh, uh, storage at incredible speeds, better SSDs, uh, um, and how they will impact the performance of the overall solution. And of course, we're going to continue to, to accelerate our processing cores, accelerators for unique uh, uh, capabilities. I want to come back in and say, you know, wow, what did we 10X this year? So that's, that's always fun. It's a great challenge to the engineering team who just heard that and said, uh, he's starting off with 10X again. <laughs> <laughs> great, Michael. That's a great wrap up too. We appreciate you coming on and sharing with the Cube audience uh, the exciting things happening at Intel with Spark. Well, thank you for the time. I really appreciate it. All right, and thank you all for joining us for this segment. We'll be back with more guests in just a few. You're watching the Cube.